Hey, good morning. What a, what a weekend so far. It's been uh, uh, exciting. Certainly been a little bit of anxiety producing. Uh, somewhat reassuring this weekend. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a strong statement on how I, how I feel about how things are going on in the world today. And what I think we ought to be doing. It's all about the future, as I told you. It's, uh, to me, it's all about the future. Uh, any of you who are grandparents, you understand what I'm talking about. It's, uh, it's not about me anymore or uh, you know, what I can accomplish. It's about what I can leave in terms of future generations. And that's where my focus has been. And I think we've got some very important, I know we have some very important choices to make that will be world changing. Uh, my hope is that we can be at the head of the pack when this change takes place so that we can offer a direction. Because change is coming. There's no question about that. Uh, the only question is, is who's going to lead us through this change and to whatever's coming next? And we'd like to have this opportunity. I, I would personally like to have the opportunity to give my point of view on where we should go. But unfortunately, there's a lot of things that are in my way. And no matter how hard I try, it just seems to be uh, there's one obstacle after the next, after the next. I think I told you on Friday night that in the 70s when I learned all this and I had met Dennis Burkett and Nathan Pritikin and C. Everett Koop had made his, uh, uh, his uh, report on nutrition and health and George McGovern had uh, written the U.S. Dietary Goals, I thought direction was set. Uh, there was nothing that was going to get in the way of changing this world to less meat more grains, more fruits, more vegetables. It was all settled in the 1970s, but I, I learned differently. There was a, a lot of money out there and a lot of vested interest, a lot of personal dietary preferences that got into my way. And so I've had to refocus, recamp, and see whether or not I can uh, move this thing forward again. And that's what this lecture is all about, is various directions we can take and decisions we have to make. And let's get basic here for a minute. Let's get personal. Why do, why do most of you make decisions in life? Well, that, I think, depends upon where you're at in life. Like, for example, Mary and I, we're at a stage in life, what we're trying to do is we're trying to delay death and disability. Seriously. That's what it's about. We're in uh, the second half of our 60s. You know, life is going to end sometime in the too near future. But between now and then, between, I'm going to be on my feet upright doing the most I can and the best possibility of me being able to do that is to be in good health. And to be in good health, I've got to eat well, get a little sunshine, a little exercise. And so Mary and I and every other one of you in this same age group, you have the same purpose, to delay death and disability. And the contribution is huge. We've learned so much at my age and stage. I know so much and so do you. And to deprive the world of this vast knowledge, no matter what your field are, it might be engineering, education, medicine, to deprive society of your genius in the years is an extreme loss. And it's necessary for our future to keep us functional and participating. So that's what we're into at our particular age now. And I realize there are some of you who are younger. And I remember what you're into. <laughs> you're into power and beauty. That's what you're into. I know that. You're, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, that's it, is power and beauty. Now, how about younger people? What are they into? That, that takes me back a long way to try and remember what young people, children, what they're interested in, why they might want to maintain and attain the best health possible. Why would they want to change their diet? Why would they want to clean up bad habits? Why would they want to exercise? What would motivate kids? Me, it's death and disability. Some of you, it's beauty and power for kids. If I remember right, it's to avoid ridicule. And the kids are sick. As was mentioned, it used to be one fat kid in the class. Now, you know, 30% of them are overweight at least. And they're sick. They have stomach aches and acne and joint pains. Our children are sick. And uh, I remember how bad it hurts to look different and to be different. Uh, this is a tragedy. This is child abuse. So there's the three age categories, the three uh, general areas of motivation that I see in people's lives, uh, which would cause them to want to really get into this, into dietary change, to sacrifice all the old things that they used to enjoy.
the most important book that has been written in all oh, the last few years is this book. I uh, read it cover to cover. I strongly recommend that you do read this book by Michael Moss. It uh, didn't teach me really anything new, but it defined clearly in a very picturesque way uh, what the industries are doing to hook us on food. And what they hook us on, as we've talked about this weekend, is food that is hyper palatable. There are so many times this weekend I wanted to jump up particularly when Dr. Peake was speaking, I wanted to jump up and I wanted to say, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Our grandkids are staying with us now, and a couple of weeks ago, one of their friends brought in some chocolate chip chocolate cookies, and I had one. Well, just a little bit of a one. But I had enough to realize that if I didn't say no, I'd have had the rest of that cookie, and that box of cookies in our home, in a McDougal household, it wasn't there any more than 42 minutes. That stuff is hyper palatable. It is impossible to stay away from. And uh, Michael Moss clearly tells us that's what industry has spent billions of dollars and sacrificed everything moral that could possibly sac be sacrificed, just like the tobacco industry. Again, it's not a conspiracy, folks. This is just business. These people are just trying to sell you their products. That's it. And they want to make them as appealing as possible. The only unfortunate thing about uh, Michael Moss's book is he, he never gave us an answer. He never gave us a solution. He just talked about the problems of industry, salt, sugar, and fat. But how to fix it, he didn't offer. The starch solution, I believe, does offer that fix. But there are so many things in our way to prevent us to, from getting to what to me is so obvious, and that is our ancestral diet, the diet that most people have eaten that have lived on planet Earth, a starch-based diet of rice, corn, potatoes. Why would it so obvious? And the agreement was so solid in the 70s. Have we gotten away from this? And how have we gotten away from this? And what do we have to do to take and get our focus back where it should be to get rid of the dietary distractions that are going on that keep us from accomplishing good health, a reduction in health care costs, saving the planet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about so much this weekend. We have to keep our focus of attention on what is true and what will make a difference. And there are all kinds of people and their ideas that are getting in the way. This is nothing personal, folks. This is about ideas that are keeping us from accomplishing what needs to be done and should have been done three decades ago. There are the people who recommend low-carb diets. Low-carb diets, those are like the Atkins people, the carbohydrate addicts people, the zone people, the various kinds of diets that are into low carbs. There are gluten-free diets that I want to talk to you about. GMO-free diets and exercise is getting in the way of us accomplishing what needs to be accomplished. Low-carb diets, they've been around forever, all these low-carb diets. South Beach diet, one of the more recent popular diets, uh, the zone, the sugar busters. These low-carb diets, what they do is they take away the sugar, which is good. Yeah, and, you know, there's no disagreement. You know, white sugar's not good for you. That's a, that's a good idea to get that out of your diet. But what they do is they generally categorize carbohydrates and don't distinguish between potatoes and table sugar. And they just tell you all carbohydrates are bad. You know, sugar's bad, so don't eat rice. That, you cannot, you cannot make that deduction. Because sugar is bad, that you shouldn't eat potatoes. But that's what they've done. And they've taken all carbohydrate out of the diet. All rice, corn, potatoes, and the sugars, that's good. And instead fed you animal foods, eggs, bacon, brie, those kinds of foods, those are low-carb diets. And where the way they work is they make you sick. If you don't have enough carbohydrate in your diet, you go into ketosis, you lose your appetite, you feel poorly, and you lose weight. That's how they work. But anything to lose weight, people think, anything to lose weight. Uh, the paleo is the new low-carb diet. That kind of thinking that we should eat like our ancestors and that our ancestors ate 55% of their food from animals is just wrong. It's just scientifically incorrect. Yet, you go to gyms across the country, CrossFit, other types of, uh, of organizations, and what they're promoting is something that is untrue, unhealthy, and uncivilized. If people were really to eat on this vast planet Earth with 7 billion people, if each and every individual was going to follow the paleo diet, that means 55% of their diet was animals. You talk about massive destruction of planet Earth. 
The estimates are just eating like Americans, we need three or four more planet Earths just to feed the people on the planet now. Now you exaggerate the Western diet to a paleo diet, you know, everything's gone. It's uncivilized to teach that kind of eating. And the latest and the most popular of all the low carb diets, and you don't recognize the low carb diet because it goes under the name wheat belly. And what you're thinking is the way to get healthy is just to avoid all wheat. Wheat is the enemy. A traditional food of human beings, wheat is the enemy. But really, if you read in detail this most popular book out there now on dieting and health, what you find is this is just a disguise for a low carb diet. This author recommends the unlimited amount of eggs, full fat dairy, chicken, fish, beef, anything you can shove in your mouth. But just don't eat wheat. And then, and then he goes on and generalizes it and says, uh, you know, you shouldn't eat uh, starches at all. Pretty much, yeah. And the public is buying into this. You see, they're desperate. The public is desperate. Whatever you say, just so I can lose weight. They don't really care. The uh, key author to the paleo diet is a fellow by the name of Lauren Cordain. And the uh, key author to this most popular diet, the wheat belly diet, that tells you that all the problems are wheat, is a fellow by the name of William Davis. Keep those names in mind for just a couple of slides, if you would, please. Lauren Cordain, William Davis, low-carb diet promoters, just like Robert Atkins. You may remember Barry Sears of the Zone. Some of you know Sally Fallon, who uh, is involved with uh, the Western Price Foundation. These are all low-carbers, promoting that you eat a lot of meat, these people are. And you say to yourself, well, why shouldn't I believe them? They're experts, uh, they're articulate, they have their scientific studies. Why shouldn't I believe them? Well, uh, as uh, our guest last night said to us, uh, I don't care what the truth is. All I want to do is get thin. And so these witches, they're saying to themselves, say what you will about eating children. It fits to the Atkins diet. And I will lose weight. And I think, not only do I think, I'm, I'm certain it is the case. Maybe they don't think about it directly. But as a consequence of what we're doing right now is we are eating children. We are destroying the future of our children. So in a desperate attempt to try and convey this information as clearly as possible, and you know that I'm not a very politically correct person. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. What I finally did is I put together a little video about low-carb dieting and about low-carb gurus and then high-carb dieting and high-carb gurus like in my camp. In my camp are people like uh, uh, Neil Bernard and uh, Codwell Esselstyn and uh, Pam Popper. Uh, these are people that are in, in our camp. These are high-carb gurus or are high star cheaters. And then there are a bunch of those low carbers and you say, who in the world can I believe? They all seem to be authoritative. going to wake people up. 
you know, as I say, I'm, I'm not into this for a popularity contest. What I, I'm trying to do is get people's uh, attention in the right direction. And these people are a diversion from what we need to do to attain good health for the people on Earth, to drastically reduce the profits and the business of the drug industries, to get control of our health care costs, and to save planet Earth. You know, I, I will do anything that it requires to try and get this message across. So that's one of our diversions, is uh, the people who are into uh, low-carb eating. You know, when I, when I talk to these people, we can sit and we can argue data back and forth about, well, our diet shows weight loss and better uh, results in diabetes, uh, and, and we say our diet does too, and the public doesn't know. But, you know, if they were to win, if they were to win, and they have won in the past, but if they continue to win this kind of philosophy that we should get our calories from eating basically livestock, then the environmental consequences are unarguable. So even if they're right, they're wrong. They're wrong. They're contributing to the death and destruction of planet Earth. Uh, let's go on to the other diversion that is very troubling to me, and that's gluten-free, the gluten-free rage. And that's what all, most all your friends are into. They go to the store, and if it's gluten-free, it's good. 30% you know, of the people in the store are looking for gluten-free items, and you find them all over the place, gluten-free items. And it's supposed to be the solution to bad health and to cause you to lose weight. At least what's what Dr. Davis says, who's the author of the Wheat Belly, and of course wheat is the primary uh, gluten food. Gluten is it comes, it's, it's a protein. It's in uh, various kinds of grains in high concentrations, and those particular grains you need to focus on when you focus upon this gluten moiety. The foods you need to focus on are wheat, barley, and rye, not oats. Oats have been claimed to be a problem, but they're oats that are contaminated with wheat, barley, or rye. It's wheat, barley, and rye that we're talking about. It's the problem. Wheat, barley, and rye, high gluten foods. These are various forms of wheat, barley, and rye, including beer, by the way. It's a, it's a high gluten food. So you might keep that in, uh, in mind as you're thinking about a gluten-free diet. The gluten is found in the uh, nugget of the, of the grain. And so when you turn it into white flour, a refined grain, you still carry the gluten moiety around with you in your food, and as a result, you'll still have problems with gluten if you're gluten sensitive. Also, mothers who are nursing babies, if they eat a diet with wheat, barley, and rye, and it happens to be a problem in their particular family, then that moiety, that gluten moiety will be transferred to the baby through the breast milk. And that's one thought as to why people develop uh, gluten intolerance the inability to eat and stay healthy when they focus on wheat, barley, and rye is that they think maybe this started early in life. And it's exposure to children at a young age from wheat, barley, and rye. And that can happen in uh, infant foods after the age of six months, but it also happens through breastfeeding, is these uh, protein moieties can get into the baby's system. And if it is a genetic setup or bad luck or whatever it is that the destiny is to have a problem with gluten, then that child may be sensitized early in life. People who are becoming vegetarians sometimes are getting very heavily into gluten foods. We've talked about seitan. Uh, seitan, or seitan, is a uh, product of taking wheat, washing it, washing everything away, the carbohydrate, the fiber, everything away, but you're just left with the wheat protein. And they make it into things that look like burgers, and look like chicken nuggets, and various types of fish sticks. And that makes it an easier transition, they say, to a healthier diet. But there are problems with all this excess wheat protein. Gluten sensitivity, plus my understanding of the scientific research is this excess protein, even if it's from vegetable sources, puts a serious burden on the body and the bones and increases the risk of osteoporosis and kidney stones. Not as seriously as animal protein does, but these isolated protein foods like soy protein or gluten, these particular foods, these seitan, the isolated gluten foods, they can be a problem, a serious burden for your health. So be careful with them. They are not health food. Realize that throughout human history, people have relied upon wheat, barley, and rye. The Middle East, the breadbasket of the world, lived on wheat, barley, and rye. If it was a serious problem, gluten was throughout human history. If it had been a determining factor, Genetically, these people would have been selected out of the population. 
because they'd have been sick from eating wheat, barley, and rye. So it would have been a natural selection to get rid of people who have this particular sensitivity, gluten sensitivity. But for one reason or another, either because the kinds of foods have changed, which some people say they're more concentrated in gluten, or maybe there's been some damage to the human gut. For whatever reasons, there are people who are sensitive to wheat, barley, and rye. Certainly not the Egyptians who lived on wheat. But there are people who are sensitive to wheat, barley, and rye. And the number of people who are sensitive to wheat, barley, and rye, people who have a problem called celiac disease, is fewer than 1%. I'll just be generous. One out of 100 people develops a serious problem from wheat, barley, and rye. Some people say it's one in 300. But it's somewhere between one in 100, one in 300 uh, people in the general population in the United States and Western Europe, when they eat wheat, barley, and rye, they develop a problem. And that problem is, is the absorptive surface of the small intestine. This one cell layer, it gets damaged. And this one cell layer is very intelligent. It's discriminated. It determines what gets into your body and what doesn't. It makes all kinds of decisions about iron and calcium and proteins and bacteria and viruses and lets good things in that you need, keeps bad things out. Well, this gut lining, this one cell layer between the inside of your gut, which is where the blood vessels are, and the uh, outside of the gut, which is where the partially digested food is, this one cell layer, if it gets damaged, you develop something called a leaky gut. And with a leaky gut, all kinds of things can get into your system and cause uh, various kinds of problems. If you are in that 1% of the population who has celiac disease, and this is a serious problem that I don't want to minimize for that 1% of the population. And that's why we label, at our programs, we label foods as gluten or non-gluten, because one out of 100 of you, this is crucial for you to know. So, people who have celiac disease, how do we identify them? Well, they have people with chronic diarrhea. They have fat in their stool because they can't digest the fat. They have unexplained weight loss, abdominal pain, bloating, growth retardation. It's a malabsorption problem because that absorptive surface, not only does it become non-discriminating, it becomes flattened. All those villi I showed you become flattened, and the ability to absorb nutrients and calories is dramatically decreased once you destroy that absorptive surface. So weight loss is characteristic of people with celiac disease, iron deficiency, a recurrent mouth sores. Uh, those are the things that you usually see. And when folks have those troubles, when I say people who don't respond to our basic diet, what I start thinking about is, well, maybe it's wheat, barley, and rye. Maybe they have a celiac disease problem. And maybe it's not really celiac disease. Maybe it's something that's subcategorized. Anyway, once you destroy that brush border, you run into various kinds of problems. Now you've destroyed that protective border, that one cell layer thickness. And that protective border, what it does is it discriminates and doesn't let things in that aren't supposed to be into your body. But once it's destroyed, then foreign proteins get into your body. And they cross-react in the form of autoimmune diseases. So you get this foreign protein, say you get cow protein in your bloodstream, and the body makes antibodies to try and kill that cow protein. Well, the body gets a little confused with all this damage to the gut and all the bad eating, and instead of just attacking that cow protein that's floating around in your blood, it may go and attack your joints or your pancreas. And that's how you get autoimmune disease. It may attack your pigment cells of your skin, and you lose the pigment cells of your skin. It may attack your thyroid gland, and as a consequence, you develop hypothyroidism. So you have a whole bunch of autoimmune diseases that can have their basis in the damage to that one cell layer thick discriminating lining. And so people with celiac disease have a high incidence of these autoimmune diseases. And when I see people in my practice who have not just rheumatoid, right, right, own rheumatoid arthritis, but they also have thyroid problems, uh, they have maybe some colitis or other intestinal problems. They have multiple autoimmune diseases. This is one of the first things I think about. They have some underlying damage to that discriminating layer. Do they have celiac disease? All kinds of other problems besides autoimmune diseases are associated with uh, celiac disease, weight loss. You have increased risk of cancers, osteoporosis. You need that one cell layer discriminating out there to take and protect you and keep you healthy. So a whole bunch of other problems follow when people don't have that, uh, that integrity of their gut. You would expect that if you put somebody on a gluten-free diet, here you have people who uh, can't absorb their food, the uh, brush border is destroyed, they have a leaky gut, they have a decrease in malabsorption, as a result they get abdominal pains, they get gas, they get bloating, and they don't absorb their calories. So characteristic of somebody who has celiac disease, that 1% of the population, is they're thin. They're malnourished. 
Well, that's the way it should be. But I have to tell you, the American diet is so intense in its calories with its oils and its sugars and so on. There are many celiac patients who are overweight. But classically, they would be thin. And you would expect when you treated these people, you took the wheat, barley, and rye out of their diet, that the absorptive capacity of the gut would increase, the integrity of the gut wall would be reestablished, and as a result, they would gain weight. You would expect weight gain. As a matter of fact, when you study people with real celiac disease, a study of over 1,000 people, what you find is when you put them on gluten-free diets, they gain weight. Yeah, uh, yes, the normal weight people, about 16% move into the overweight category. Those who start overweight, they get even fatter. Well, they should, because you're correcting the problem. But what we're sold is we're sold gluten-free diets to lose weight. How, how does that happen? Well, you know, the public, uh, any way to lose weight, even eat children, doesn't matter. <laughs> but the truth is, it doesn't work. It's been assessed in uh, various publications. They've looked at the scientific literature, uh, <clears throat> the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Diet. They say, uh, despite growing popularity of gluten-free diets and celebrity endorsements of the merits of a gluten-free diet for weight loss, there are no published reports showing that a gluten-free diet produces weight loss. Excuse me, that's why your friends are on gluten-free diets, to lose weight. And, and uh, the uh, Journal of the American Dietetic Association says the same thing. These are huge reviews of the scientific literature. Do gluten-free diets cause weight loss or not? And they say no. At this time, there's no scientific evidence that these diets result in weight loss. Yet this is the number one approach in the United States for solving health and weight problems, is gluten-free diets. They don't work. They shouldn't work. There's no reason for them to work. In fact, you go to the store and you look for gluten-free foods, what do you find? You find uh, high-fat cakes, cookies, and falafels. You're supposed to lose weight eating gluten-free cookies? And, uh, these are very high-fat foods, and of course the fat you eat is the fat you wear. You would expect people who go on gluten-free diets to be fat, a la author of the wheat belly. <laughs> All right, what happens when you do eat uh, wheat, barley, and rye? This was studied at my alma mater. Uh, Michigan State University, this was done just after I graduated from Michigan State University. They went into a dormitory situation at Michigan State University, they found overweight men, and what they told these overweight men to do is they told them to eat more bread. You know, high gluten food, but that was irrelevant to the study. Uh, they told them to eat a food that all, uh, all your friends are avoiding, which is bread. Bread is bad. Well, bread is the staff of life, excuse me. The bread basket of the world. Bread has been key to human survival. But, but they tell you, no, no, bread's what's making you fat. So they did this experiment which was published uh, in uh, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition back in the late 70s, where they took overweight men at Michigan State University, where I graduated from, and they told them to do one thing. They didn't tell them that they needed to cut back on the meat or the oil or the sugar. They didn't tell them they needed to eat less. No, all they told them is you must eat 12 slices of bread a day. That's all they had to do. So they ate 12 slices of bread a day, and uh, for eight weeks they did this. They published the study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, 1979. And what they found is that when they fed these slightly overweight men white bread, is they lost on average in two months 14 pounds. And if they got the whole grain bread, they lost a few more pounds. They lost 19 pounds on average in two months. Unconsciously! They didn't even think about it. They just ate the bread. Now what did the bread do? It displaced higher calories, more weight gaining fats from meats and oils and cheese and so on. It just pushed them aside. They didn't have room to eat these other more fattening foods. Just by adding starch, bread, the high gluten food. That's what they did. Now you may not be excited about eating 12 slices of bread a day to lose that extra say 20 pounds in two months, but you can do it with any kind of starch. I offer you a starch challenge. You're not buying into the McDougal philosophy 100%? No problem. Just add more starch to your diet and see what happens. And you can add that in the form of, say, four cups of steamed rice a day. That would be fine. That would be uh, sufficient as opposed to the slices of bread. You could have four cups of boiled corn, four mashed potatoes, four baked sweet potatoes. I'm not saying and, I'm saying or. Okay. Uh, three cups of beans, peas, and lentils, four cups of baked spaghetti noodles, 12 slices. You just add six to 900 calories of extra starch, and you will get similar results if you're an overweight man as these men attained unconsciously just by adding more bread to their diet. 
displaces the higher fat foods, adds that appetite satisfying carbohydrate to your diet. And as a result, you get healthier and trimmer. Uh, these men, by the way, they uh, dropped their cholesterol in two months. The average drop cholesterol was between 50 and 75 points. Yeah. Studies on other gluten-containing grains are also very encouraged. When they compared rye to, say, bread, they found rye was even more satisfying. And barley's very satisfying. These are satisfying foods for a very important reason, and that is that is your food. And when you eat what you're supposed to eat, you ought to get a reward. And that reward is satisfaction from performing that particular behavior, which is eating. You should expect that satisfaction. If you're not getting it, there's something wrong. All right. Well, besides celiac disease, there are people who are sensitive to the protein. They get allergies to wheat. And these are wheat allergies, uh, like an uh, allergy that Baker's got, uh, Baker's asthma, or chronic stuffy nose, rhinitis. There are maybe well, let's say fewer than 1% of people who have wheat allergies. So you've got celiac, 1% or less. You've got wheat allergies, 1% or less. Okay. Then we have wheat sensitivity. We've got this whole new category of problems. And I know some of you are mad at me by this point, but that's okay. Because I'm uh, picking on one of your pillars of, uh, of good diet and one of your hopes for a better future. There's a whole new category, and uh, the estimates are by some people, they're not reliable, they're not based on evidence, but the estimates are there's this whole category of people that don't have celiac disease, which is a serious problem. They don't have the wheat allergies, which, you know, is troublesome to say the least. But they have uh, this nondescript, poor feeling. They're, they're wheat sensitive, they don't feel good, they're too fat. Uh, the the st stomach is all upset, they've got aches and pains, they feel horrible. And as a result, your friends and relatives think they have something called wheat sensitivity. I don't believe that. I think this is just an excuse, a diversion for people who are looking for a solution and they haven't quite got to the point of understanding what the real solution is. And that is that human beings are starchivores, starchitarians. They're starch eaters. And that's why they're sick, and they just transfer that sickness to the idea that maybe it's wheat, barley, and rye. And I can give up wheat, barley, and rye as long as I can continue to eat pork chops and ice cream. No problem at all. Just no difficulty at all there, folks. All right. So people are sick because of the regular diet that they're eating. They're sick from all the animal foods, all the, uh, all the hyper, hyper taste foods that we have, all the garbage up there. They're sick. They're looking for a solution. They focused at this moment. It'll change. There'll be another popular explanation as to why people are sick in a few years, as there has been in the past. In the past, you were told you were sick because you're a neurotic. You were told you were sick because you had hypoglycemia. You've been given all kinds of excuses as to why you're sick in the past, and you've bought into them. But the reason you're sick is because you eat the wrong diet for human beings. And the way you fix it is you eat a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. And I bet, I bet that when people do that, when we go and look for their wheat sensitivities, they'll virtually all be gone. Oh, okay, I'll give them 1%. percent i give them 1%. So 1% celiac disease, 1% wheat allergies, and let's give them 1% wheat sensitivities. Now we've got 3% of the population that ought to stay away from wheat, barley, and rye. I'm being generous, very generous. All right. This is also, I want to point out, this whole passion, this rage about gluten. Not only does it not work, not only is it incorrect, not only is it diverting us from what we really need to know, but it's also hurting people who truly have celiac disease. These people get very sick when they eat wheat, barley, and rye. So you go into the restaurant, and you tell the, uh, the waiter, you say, uh, I, 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 I've got a wheat problem. I need to stay away from wheat, and the waiter comes out with your soup, and there's a few croutons on the top, and the waiter watches you eat the croutons, even though you told him that you have a wheat problem, and the person does fine. You say, no big deal. You know, they're just, uh, it's not really a big deal to have these gluten sensitivities. Because I just saw, you know, 15 people, uh, even though they said that they have this wheat problem, they ate the food and they didn't drop dead on our floor. They didn't get sick. Well, how about the person, the guy or gal who walks in that really does have celiac disease? And they say, look, you know, you'll get violently ill if I eat wheat, barley, and rye. This could be devastating to me. They go, oh, pff, big deal. I've last 15 people told me that wasn't true. Well, it is true. And you hurt these people, too, by this misinformation. If you really have a problem with wheat, then don't eat it. 
There are all kinds of non-gluten starches, loads of them out there. You can get into all kinds of different grains like millet and quinoa and rice. Rice in China, if you uh, say food, uh, it is uh, the same as rice. They're interchangeable terms. People in China say, saying, hello, how are you? They say, have you had your rice today? Yeah, you could go to rice, the most popular grain in the world. Well, corn may be the most popular grain in the world. But rice is one of the most popular. Or you can go to potatoes or sweet potatoes. You can still be a starchivore. You can still live on a starch-based diet if it is true that you should not be eating these wheat, barley, and rice. You know, it's, it's a big picture. And while we're goofing around trying to figure out how to get things solved, we're diverting our attention away from what really is going to make a difference, which is to uh, reduce or eliminate the destructive parts of our environment that we have control of. And remember, we can change our diet in 15 minutes. We can make a difference just right away. And now we have genetically modified foods, GMOs. Oh, I uh, uh, don't want to see any tears. But when I mention GMOs, when I start talking about GMOs, people get very emotional. I am not kidding me, kidding you. Uh, people who come up to me afterwards, and I do apologize for your, this emotional issue you have, but when I talk about GMOs, somehow I've just ripped their heart out. I've just stolen away from their religion. I, I just took away from, from them uh, what they believe to be the evil in the world is GMO foods, and Monsanto being the, uh, the epitome of that evil. Well, GMO production. GMO production, uh, 1994, just uh, became commercially available. 1996, you see an increase in GMO. GMO, genetically modified foods. This is messing around with the genes. This is where they, and we'll talk about this in a second. You see, the uh, GMOs just started about 1994, 1996, 1998, you see. Just started to increase uh, production of soybeans and uh, corn that you'd be eating. Here at 2004, we didn't start GMO corn until about 2004. Now, the reason that people say GMOs, these genetically modified foods, are a health hazard, they are the worst thing, that, they're, they're, they're the biggest threat to our future generations, is a quote from a famous documentary that just came out about GMO foods. The biggest threat to future generations. The reason they say that is they see an association between the increase in the intake of GMO foods and disease. GMO production worldwide, it's primarily in the US, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, India and China also, lots of GMO food production. GMO labeling is mandatory in uh, Brazil, Europe, Russia, China, they have to tell you whether or not GMO is in the food. I think that's a good idea. I really do. I, I, in every way, think you ought to know what's in your food. So I support GMO food labeling. But in the United States, we don't have mandatory GMO food labeling. So you don't know what's in the food. You don't know whether it's GMO or not. In fact, they tell you that we're not going to GMO label the food because it will scare the consumer inappropriately and they stay away from our products. So you know all the laws that have come up and the, the things that you voted on to get uh, GMO label passed. So it's mandatory in this country to label GMO foods. I'm all for that. I got a letter after I wrote the newsletter uh, last month, August 2013, about GMO foods. And this is, I know, is some of your response. And I just want to address this by this letter, which I don't have permission to show, but I don't really care. It was from one of my uh, newsletter subscribers. Uh, the person says, which I know some of you are thinking, I understand the message of cutting out animal products sometimes gets back to the seat of GMOs. But throwing stones at your audience, I, I know you believe that your audience, who predominantly feel GMOs are dangerous and have been directly linked to leaky gut and autoimmune disorders, uh, paint you in the light of being a recruiter, being recruited by Monsanto. I am not recruited by Monsanto, but that's what people, or pro-GMO lobbyists. Even if this is the farthest thing from the truth, please tread lightly with your pro-GMO stance. You risk a mass exodus of your followers. I know I risk that. But, I, you know, I don't care. I mean, I care. But there's something else I care more about, and that is people getting back on focus to stop these diversions. GMO is a diversion. GMO foods, if you don't believe it's a diversion, you can avoid them. You just buy organic or label GMO, or you look at the labels. You know, probably most of you, that there's a number code on your foods. If it starts with a 9, then it's non-GMO. If it starts with an 8, it is GMO. So you can make a choice. Mandatory labeling would be good, but you can make choices. There are choices out there for you. If you're not buying into what I say, I understand. GMO foods are unnatural. In nature, genes are not exchanged between species, whereas in GMO production, scientists take genes out of plants, 
and put them in animals, take genes out of animals, put them in plants, bacteria, they transfer genes and so on. They actually take segments of genes and do something that is, uh, it, it, it's unnatural. It seems unethical. But it is what's going on today. And they take, and they take this gene out of, say, a, a plant or an animal. They take a gene out of an animal. They slice a little section of it out. And they inject it into another species. It can be in another kingdom, like in the uh, plant or animal kingdom. can inject it into an entire different, different kingdom, entirely different species, and get it incorporated into the DNA and make foods with special characteristics such as soybeans that resist the pesticide Roundup. You know, the other weeds are killed, but not the soybeans. So we make these special foods that are supposed to help human beings, supposed to help planet Earth by increasing the availability of food, which we need so much because we have 7 billion people. But it sounds terrible. And, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to tell you that it's right, but it's real. It's what's happening, and it's where our focus of attention is. And so we have demonstrations in the street about GMO foods. People are so upset about this. The allergies, the weight gain, the gastrointestinal problems, the only evidence that connects these with GMO foods is the rise in the number of these diseases concurrently with the rise in production of GMO foods. There are a few animal studies. They're very controversial. Um, and I have to say, and again, I, I just have to give you my impression of this. You may think I'm being biased. But the results of the animal studies are questionable. Uh, there are changes that are not as dramatic as a heart attack or cancer. There are changes that are seen in these animals that are of some importance. But uh, they've been elevated to a scare level that is entirely inappropriate. So I told you, the GMO production, here it is, starting right here. The reason they say GMOs are bad for you is because concurrently there's an increase in disease. So here's GMO production starting here, you know, about 1998 or so. GMO production, here you go, increase in soybeans, increase in corn here as late as 2004. But how about our diseases? They, they started long before GMOs were here. Here you see the uh, incidence of obesity that's taking place. Here's when uh, GMO foods were introduced here. Look, look at the rise in obesity in the U.S. long before GMO products were put into the commercial availability any place in the world. So the, uh, this is a coincidental relationship that occurred long before GMO. Same thing with diabetes. GMO foods were introduced, but look at the increase of diabetes that has been occurring since the uh, late 1950s. The evidence they provide is incorrect. Oh, eventually, someday along the line, it may turn out in 50 or 100 years that these GMOs are important. In 50 to 100 years, excuse me, I'm trying to focus our attention on things that are going to make a difference in the next three, five, or 10 years. Tell me I'm wrong in 50 or 100 years. I would love to hear that. Well, if I was alive, that'd be pretty pretty. <laughs> so anyway. We have so many catastrophic things going on in the world. We must get the problems fixed. We cannot focus on things that are not going to result in a direct change in our future. And low-carb diets and gluten-free diets and GMO foods are detract, distracting us from where we need to think and go. Exercise. <laughs> I, all my career, it's been diet and lifestyle and exercise. Excuse me, it's diet. But, but somehow it softens the message. Well, diet and lifestyle and exercise. Well, that's okay. Forget the diet. I'll take care of the exercise. And that's what's happened to the public. And they've said, in the scientific public, they said, no, the problem is exercise. Forget the food. You can eat whatever you want. Just exercise. Well, that's not true. And we know that's true, true particularly uh, some recent uh, data that's come up, national data just published on the increase in exercise in the United States that occurred, has occurred in the last 10 years. People exercise in this country more than they ever did before, and yet obesity rates have dramatically increased. Exercise will not compensate for their rich Western diet. I'm not trying to tell you exercise is bad. I'm not trying to tell you GMO foods are good. I'm not trying to tell you nobody has a gluten problem. I'm not trying to tell you you can't lose weight on low-carb diets. I'm telling you, you've got to stop thinking about these things and get on to the matters of importance. We have a world to save. We have a health care system to save. We have people's lives to save. We have children to protect. We're missing, we're missing the elephant in the room. And, and, and you know, we're gonna, it's all going to be said and done. And we're going to look back and we're going to say what a horrible mistake we made not giving all attention, all effort to what this problem is and solving the problem. 
just published, The Ten Leading Causes of Death Worldwide. Heart disease, the leading cause of death worldwide, strokes number two. And for the first time, well, the second time, the WHO said it in 2002, World Health Organization. But the first time in major Western medical journals that came out in JAMA this last month, telling us that of all the things that cause chronic disease, it's diet, it's the food. We're, the scientific community is finally getting around to recognizing what they are personally eating as scientists, what they're serving at their medical meetings is killing the population. It's the food, folks. It's the food. Obesity rates worldwide, diabetes rates worldwide. You see the rich countries having high rates of diabetes. We talked about that's related to the direct, there's the association. It's meat consumption worldwide, dairy consumption worldwide. Here, just, just compare the figures. Compare the darker areas when we talk about obesity, we talk about diabetes, and then we look at the foods people are consuming, the meat and the dairy, they're overlapping. This is the problem, it's the food, and the food that we're talking about is the problem, is the animal food consumption and the oils. Sugar's not health food. Refined flours aren't health food. But we need to get our attention upon what's gonna really make a huge difference. And the solution to the problem, which uh, Michael Moss didn't answer in his book, excellent book that I encourage you to read, the solution to the problem is we must eat. We must eat as people, as a nation, as a world. We must eat, human beings must eat. You can't just tell people to give up meat and dairy. You've got to tell them what to eat instead. And what they need to eat instead is starch. Rice and corn and potatoes and beans and peas and lentils, the traditional foods of people in paleo times. Like we talked about the Neanderthals, 50,000 years ago, lived on starch. We are always will be starch eaters. We must eat. We must get those calories instead of from animal foods and oils. We must get them from pasta and bean burritos and veggie burgers. Yes, all the things that we've enjoyed, the oatmeal. That's where we need to go to solve the problems. And I wrote a book called The Starch Solution to help people with that. It's probably the last book I'll ever write on nutrition. It's the best Mary and I have been able to do. It's 40 years of experience. I encourage you to read it. It's called The Starch Solution. That's where it's all about. It's the first book that hasn't had my name in the title. And then we've gone one step further. I can't do this alone. I, I need your help. And so what we did this year is we put out a, 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 the Starch Solution certification course. And this is a, a series of lectures followed by a test which uh, allows people to get a certification in the Starch Solution. As a result, I am going to create an army of people, you, to help me go out and change things. With this certification, it says that you understand, and I passed a test to certify, that you understand the starch solution. Many people have taken this course, many people in here have taken it, and I have, of course, been very pleased to hear how much you enjoy the certification course. This is a tool, you get the DVDs, you get the streaming videos, you get the tests, you get recommendations on how to set up uh, two hour, four hour classes, uh, week long classes, eight week classes, how to set up classes so you can help people at your church, at your school, at your company. You can be, and I want you to be, an instructor in the Starch Solution to help me, to help the rest of the people out here who believe so strongly that we can make a difference, to go out and teach this message to your local cardiologists and their patients to your public health community. Let's get out there and make a difference. So we have these classes, certification is available, I need your help, I ask for your help. I know that you're here and you're listening, you're watching over the internet because you understand this too. We have to make a difference. And we can, but we have to get our attention focused, we have to know where the major problems are, we cannot be distracted, we have to be uh, unflinching, we have to be aggressive in whatever way you are, you be like me, you get in their face. You'd be like Mary, you just stand there and say, look at me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <clears throat>